I believe the world needs a new set of real models, people with deep intentions behind their actions, and this is where you meet them. Today's guest is Kenneth Cole, and I'm so grateful because we all know he's a designer, he's an activist, he's a married father of three who believes that he thrives at work, the home, and his community because he merges the three worlds. Kenneth, I'm so grateful, honored, and happy to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Jay. That's yeah. really, very kind of you. I don't know that I thrive in each of those areas. I aspire to thrive in all three of those areas. Absolutely. And yeah, thank you. last time we were together, you were so gracious and patiently sat and listened to me tell my story. I'm glad that I get to reciprocate today and listen to your incredible journey, your brand, which is 35 years bold, which I love. But I want to start off by asking you that question because I think my audience will love it. How do you merge those three worlds? Because I feel that today we live in a world that's so disconnected. People see their work, their family, their friends as these three separate parts. But you've somehow aspired to merge them. How does that work? Let's unpack that. Well, I think they are separate parts. And I, but I think that being successful in anything that we set out to do is all consuming and it requires making significant life compromises, which is not, an, not easy for anybody in and of itself. So, and so one can be successful professionally, invariably they're taking away from their personal needs. And because they're working extra hours and they're giving of themselves physically as well as emotionally and mentally, they're not present to the degree they need to be. And, um, and then if they're successful personally and their personal lives are coming together, and then very often they're struggling. The professional quotient of component doesn't always fall in line. And then if you layer on top of that, you know, the community um, outreach or engagement slash friends, then it, it, it complicates it even further. So I, <laughs> I came to realize, absent of a good therapist, that, um, that if I could somehow marry them, um, and by my, what I did from nine or whenever it was I, that I showed up in the office was addressing multiple agendas simultaneously, then it, I was more likely to find fulfillment in that process. So I brought social engagement into my business model very early on in the process. And I'm not sure it was intentional or it just happened and then by, um, by nature of it, of being able to bring all these incremental resources to it, it became successful in that regard. And, um, and then, and also familial at the same time as well, personal and professional and social engagement um, at every intersection. And, um, and, and I and encourage people to do it, but it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to be successful at anything in and of itself today. Mm. Let's, let's rewind a little because you talk about how, of course, you were going to law school and then you switch into fashion because you have this rebellious nature and you thought that fashion didn't have any rules as opposed to law. Tell us, tell us about that transition. So I was going to go to law school because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think I'm all about creating alternative paths. And so if I, with a legal education, I can now have one more set of of opportunities, hopefully, um, to, to look forward to. Um, but in that process, um, my father had a small shoe factory at the time in this very depressed area of New York called Williamsburg. Uh, <laughs> I love how it's changed. And it's always oh a change. So then, um, so I worked with him one summer and I navi kept navigating to the pattern room, to the design room. And I, because I was fascinated because that's where it all happened or didn't happen. And if the product was distinctive and specifically appropriate, business would reflect it. And if it wasn't, it wasn't. So that's where I kept finding myself. And I learned how to make shoes. I learned how to make patterns. I learned how to, um, I taught myself how to draw technically, which I hadn't up until that point. And, um, and I realized quickly that um, law is about it's reading, it's a book, and he who learns it the best um, goes the furthest. And he who can interpret it the most successfully realizes the greatest rewards. Whereas in business, um, you pretty much write your own book. 
every day. You write your rules. And in the fashion business, specifically, the further those rules are from anything written before you, the more likely it, it is that you'll be successful. So there's, essentially, there's no boundaries. So, you know, we're taught as children to draw within the lines, but you realize in, in my business that the more successful, the success usually is outside those lines. So, um, and I was fascinated with it, and, uh, and success was relatively, reasonably um, short in coming, um, or, or rewards from that. Success is a tough, is a difficult word for me to, but. Um, Why is it so, difficult? Explain well, that. Well, only because it's, it's so subjective, and success in what was successful yesterday only defines new boundaries for tomorrow. So, and, uh, and we can't, kind of lose sight. We can't harbor over what happened yesterday because then we fail in our ability to do what we need to do tomorrow. So, mm. um, but we can get to that. Yeah, so, yeah, let's get to that. <laughs> so um, I realized that, that the, this business, the shoe business at the time specifically was, was fascinating to me and there was essentially no, no boundaries. And, and you take a, this, this um, shoe, this um, object, and you can transform it in so many different subtle ways, and, and sometimes even the most subtle ways make the greatest um, change mm. and impact the, the greatest. So, and I stayed on that path, and I kept deferring going to law school, and I eventually never went. We all focus on our diets and workouts as a part of living a healthier life, but we spend too little time concerned with our posture. When we partnered with Fully, my team and I started to pay attention to how much time we spend sitting hunched over every day. Whether it's doing research in our home offices or in our podcast studio, it's a lot of hours stuck in an uncomfortable position. So... To feel better at work, we want to introduce you to Fully. Fully transforms the way we feel at work and home with desks, chairs, and other tools to keep our bodies moving and our minds engaged. Fully actually came and created an active and comfortable office space for my whole team, and I'm so grateful because now my team has the ability to work creatively, feel safe, feel comfortable, and work to their best. Now, they've got standing desks that I love, but they also have a wide variety of active sitting chairs. Depending on your style, whether you're a fidgeter or a traditionalist, they've got you covered. Fully is great for all your office needs and is a no-brainer. And they'll be your partner in reimagining what your work can feel like. To transform your workspace, go to fully.com forward slash J. That's fully, F-U-L-L-Y dot com forward slash J. Have you ever found yourself in a department store aisle looking through countless basics, t-shirts, sock options, but not knowing which to choose? Better yet, choosing one and knowing that the chances are high you won't like the fit or quality or something else. If you said yes, you've just experienced the frustration of the founders of Mack Weldon. Mack Weldon has made it their mission to make sure your basics are smartly designed and shopping for them is convenient. Now, they literally started from scratch and engineered their own fabric. To be straightforward, Mack Weldon is better than whatever you're wearing right now. Mack Weldon has the most comfortable socks, shirts, and sweatpants that you'll ever wear. Now, I work out daily, so their silver underwear line is essential. They're naturally antimicrobial, which eliminates odor. Fun fact, they have applied the best of high-end workout gear to your everyday basics. Now, shopping on the site is super simple and an overall great experience. No more frustrations. If you're still not convinced, check this out. Your comfort is their priority, so if you don't like your first pair of underwear, you can keep it and they will still refund you. No questions asked. For 20% off your first order, visit macweldon.com and enter the promo code on purpose. That's macweldon.com and use the code on purpose. What's your advice for people who are listening who feel like you did? They chose to do something because they don't know what to do. And I find so many people find that they end up in college degrees or jobs or positions in companies because they just didn't know what to do. How did you kind of break away from that and start using that as a launch pad to explore? Well, I don't know that I, I broke away from it. I, I still sometimes wonder if I know what to do. But <laughs> I, I knew that, I, that what I was doing felt good and I knew that I could do this 
in a way that could be um, meaningful in some way. And so, and I knew I needed to explore it further. And, um, and, I, and in the law school, I could probably always do. And I was only, my interest in law really was just to create more opportunities for myself. And I found that I was on a path that, um, that uh, was, was fulfilling just to, a, to a degree. So I just stayed on that path. Right. And, and you ended up posing as a filmmaker to be able to sell shoes at the beginning. Tell us about that. Introduce us to that story because I love it. So I left that working with my father after a couple of years and I wanted to do my own thing. And it was a hard decision, but I knew if I didn't do it then, it would only, my life would only get more complicated as I got older. And, um, and I was still single and I had no real obligations in the world. And I, so I had a little bit of money, but not enough to start a business. And um, I, very little bit of money. So, and I, uh, there wasn't these mechanisms in place like tech world has today where you can raise, you can do a raise and you can outsource and you can crowdsource and you can find all these resources. I didn't have that. So I- Go fund me, yeah. Right, so I uh, wanted to start a business that was more personal and I, um, so I left what I was doing and I needed to, a, a, and I, I named the company, I set up a company, I named it Kenneth Cole because there weren't these search engines then where you could make up a name and find out if it was ownable sure. because it, it, you would, it, the process invariably took 18 months before you knew if there were objections and then you had to address those objections and then maybe you had to, you'd win or you'd lose and you'd have to rename your, your, your business. So I, you could almost always get your name, your own name mm -hmm. um, registered. So I named the company Kenneth Cole. And I ran to Italy um, knowing I had a better chance of getting credit from an Italian shoe factory that needed business than from an American bank that didn't. And so I found a couple of factories and I found some people over there that were, wanted to help me. And I designed a line of cool lady shoes. And then I came back and had to sell them. And there was a trade show at the time, the New York Shoe Show is what it was called. And then at the time, and in that process, you had two choices. You could um, take a room at the Hilton Hotel and there were about 1,100 other shoe companies. And there was 30 floors, 30 some odd companies per floor. And the buyers would, would come and they'd walk all the floors. Not very um, distinctive, not um, very differentiated and, um, and not without cost. So, and then the other option was to take a big fancy showroom within a two block radius of the Hilton Hotel with clearly I didn't have the money or the time for that either. So on a whim, I called a friend who was in the trucking business and I said, if I could figure out how to park one of your 40 foot trailers across the street from the Hilton Hotel, would you lend it to me? And he said, sure jerk, this is New York. You can't park a bicycle for 10 minutes, let alone a truck for four days. I said, if I could figure it out, will you lend it to me? He says, if you could figure out, I'll help you decorate it. So I called the mayor's office, it was Mayor Koch at the time. I said, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, how does one get permission to park a 40 foot trail on the corner of 6th Avenue and 56th Street? On December, first week of December, sorry, son, they don't. This is New York. We get permission only under two circumstances. If you are a utility company servicing the streets, AT&T or Con Ed, or if you are a production company shooting a full-length motion picture, because we were going through an I Love New York campaign in the early 80s, and we probably still are today. So I said, thank you, Mr. Mayor, hung up the phone. That afternoon I went to a stationery store, changed the letterhead from Kenneth Cole Inc. to Kenneth Cole Productions Inc. Filed for a permit the following morning um, with the mayor's office for permission to shoot a full length motion picture called The Birth of a Shoe Company. I opened for business on December 2nd, uh, a week later, 10 days later. Um, and I had two New York policemen as my doorman, compliments of our fine mayor. And I had uh, creek light stanchions and I had um, a director, and sometimes it was filming his camera, sometimes it wasn't. And um, we saw every important buyer in New York. The more important they were, the longer we made them wait. And we sold 40,000 pairs of shoes in two and a half days. Um, <laughs> there was a phone booth on the corner. That was my line of connection to the, to the source, the factories. 
and I was changing the orders from high heels to low heels to red to blue, and um, delivered the shoes in six weeks. And, and, um, and I tell that story still because it speaks to the importance of resourcefulness and problem solving. The best solution is rarely the most creative. It's rarely the most expensive. It's almost always the most creative. And the company, um, by the way, went public 10 years later, traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and was KCP, Kenneth Cole Production. And we stayed public for 20 years. We just recently went private. I love that story. It's, I mean, what you just said there, the amount of people that only see the blocks. I mean, the fact that you called the mayor up in the first place, and the mayor actually picked up. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was somebody in his office. But, yeah, yeah. And, but, and the, but the nuance there, by the way, is sure. not, can I park the truck there? Because sure. the answer would have been no. The question is, how can I park the truck there? Yes. Under what scenario? And that, in, in, that, in that question was the answer I needed. Mm. So, um, and I figured out what I needed to be in order to be able to do what I needed, what I hoped to accomplish. Uh, yeah. So, and, and if he had said no, if that was um, we would have probably found another path. But. No, definitely, and that's what I love, that today I feel there's, especially for everyone watching, and I hear this so often, that there's just, oh, this doesn't work, or I tried this, but that path had a block, or we went down this road and then it got cut off, and I feel like a lot of us are constantly finding excuses or finding blocks more often than what you just said. It was just about asking the right question. Right, asking the right question to the right person in the right mm. way. Mm. And um, call a restaurant. Do you have cap- availability? No, but well, under what scenario could you have <laughs> So, um, Do you still practice that today? Do you have to still practice that? Has I that energy I stayed? I do that in the ordinary course. Okay. But because there are inherent obstacles in everything we do. So the question is, how do we get from here to where we need to in the most efficient and productive way? And an and, and, and appropriate way, by the way. I don't... I don't seek to do anything that's inappropriate, sure. nor was what I did that day inappropriate. Mm-hmm. But although I do know that today, if you, the mayor's office is much more careful um, in <laughs> how they issue you. permits <laughs> because I've told this story so many times. But, <laughs> but based upon the rules as they existed, I wasn't inappropriate. In fact, we, that story never got, that movie never got um, told, unfortunately, but in this world of content creation. But um, Do you have any of the footage? Well, Pete, some of that footage actually is on our company uh, website. Yes. And also, I think, uh, on our uh, inst- company's Instagram, um, some of the original trailer footage. That's brilliant. If anyone listening right now or watching does not get inspired by that to figure out a way to their goal, you know, I don't know what will. That's, it's, there's so many elements in there where you had to just make it work, call a different person. And the fact that you're ordering, you know, like you said, now we have technology, now we have social media. You were standing next to a payphone to make your orders. Right. Like th- a, lot, that, a lot of quarters. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, stacked on top, exactly. Just keep going there, and I just feel like that resourcefulness is something that's so useful today as a skill, and we have more resources to be resourceful with. Right. But it's the mindset. It's such a, it's a totally different world today, and, and the obstacles, the objectives, the challenges are just different. Mm. What are the challenges today? You know, I mean, you just speak to people in my business today, and they say, you know, everybody everywhere is a competitor. It's too hard. And because everybody who offers product, product is available to everybody everywhere. There's literally an infinite amount of alternatives mm. because by the time you get halfway through that list, there's twice as many that have, have since been created. So, yes. and so, but I argue, make the case that there's also twice as many, op- infinite amount of opportunities as a result. Mm. So you can look at the obstacles, you can, you can look, at, uh, look at it from another context. And um, every, Everybody who makes shoes or fashion everywhere is, is a competitor, but everybody who consumes fashion or product everywhere is a customer. Absolutely. So, you know, it's a different time, but we just change and kind of refocus the lens through which we see it. And then it's something that, that, that we do every day. How do we make an impact in the world? How do we make a meaningful impact in people's lives? And uh, how do we make what we do worthwhile and purposeful? And it's not, it's a question I asked 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago, but it's a question I still ask today. The answer is different. Um, and the mechanism to realize it is different still. But the questions aren't different. It's often said, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. 
I've seen so many young and growing companies run into trouble over the last few years, and the common theme has been the fact that they have several different systems which don't talk to each other, right? There's just no communication. They've got one system for accounting, they've got one system for sales, another one for inventory, and so on, and maybe you can relate. It's just a big, inefficient mess, which takes up too much time, too much energy, and too much resources. Now, this platform will allow you to optimize processes, drive operational excellence, sell across more channels, and much, much more. We just started using NetSuite by Oracle. It's a number one cloud business management software, and what it does is that it handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform, right? What it's really giving you is the visibility and control you need in order to grow. With NetSuite, you save time, you save money and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance and accounting, orders and HR instantly right from your desktop or phone all in one place. Now, that's really why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. Right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits at netsuite.com forward slash J. That's netsuite.com forward slash J to download your free guide called seven key strategies to grow your profits. Head over right now to netsuite.com forward slash J and grab that. Definitely. And, and that leads us on nicely because in 1985, when you launched the AIDS campaign, you say that shifted the brand forever. It was such a huge moment for the brand. What were your answers to that question 30 years ago? Yeah, because, um, well, just you, you, need, you need to create the context, what was happening in 1985. So, um, so I'd been in business now a couple of years, and I was... Um, and my, my goal was always to figure out how to speak to people about what was not just on their body, but was on their mind. Mm -hmm. And knowing that I'd have a much more meaningful connection and relationship and much more sustainable than any heel height or any hem length or... So, and so I would periodically reflect on what, what we were all um, consumed with. And at that point, there was this pervasive consciousness that we hadn't seen since the 60s. And it was about um, hunger, and it was to a large degree in Ethiopia. And there were these initiatives that were happening um, constantly. There was, um, uh, it was We Are the World um, it, with Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones, and, and it was Live Aid, and it was World Aid, and it was Hands Across America. And everybody wanted to be part of something bigger than they were, something I hadn't really experienced in my um, uh, somewhat uh, adult life. And so, but it was odd because nobody was talking about what was really this looming dark cloud called HIV AIDS because, actually it wasn't even called AIDS yet, it was just HIV, because if you did, you were, um, because, well A, the stigma attached to people who had HIV was so severe um, and so significant. And if you addressed it publicly, you were perceived to be at risk. And that meant you were either an intravenous drug user, you were maybe Haitian, or you were gay. And the stigma against each of those groups was, was overwhelming. Um, so I saw this rare opportunity to talk about something that was really important that nobody was talking about. And and I only had a little bit of money at the time. We were a very small company. So we did a, I did a campaign. I reached out to Annie Leibowitz, who um, was, and then she still is an important social photographer. And, um, and Annie agreed to help me. I don't think she knew who I was at the time, but she <laughs> loved the message and she loved the idea. And we reached out to all these models, the biggest models in the industry, and, and they all wanted to do it. So we did a campaign that speak, spoke about the fact that nobody was speaking about this ominous, um, ominous dark cloud called AIDS, HIV AIDS. And um, it changed me, changed the man, changed the brand and the company in, in a very profound way. And um, you know, I had, it, I, what I was doing was fulfilling, but it wasn't meaningful. And, 
And I had a hard time asking my associates to put in the hours and do what, they, do what I needed them to do, and do to be successful. Because um, I don't believe anybody can really be successful doing anything today nine to five. Um, and between your physical engagement, your emotional involvement, your resources you need to bring to bear at anything you want to do requires um, you know, making a commitment. So um, I uh, needed to make what I was doing more important than it was um, in the ordinary course. And, and this did it. It just made it important. And we, and we stayed on this path and I was asked to do, um, we did this campaign and I did it in conjunction with AMFAR, who was the, one of the only AIDS research organizations at the time. So we did it bringing, shining a light on their work and, uh, and I believe that a cure for AIDS would only come from research and that's what AMFAR did. And then a year or so later, a year and a half later, they asked me to join the board. And, and I did. And then they asked me to become chairman in 2004. And I did. And in the 14 years from that point forward, um, and, and in the many years throughout, I, um, AMFAR had a very profound impact on millions of people's lives. And um, millions of people were alive, I believe, not because of AMFAR alone, but because of, of, of a lot of AMFAR's important work. Uh, and I continued to do personal efforts to engage a global HIV community. And, uh, and I, in 2004, at the same simultaneously, I did a campaign that, a global campaign that we all have AIDS. If we don't have it meant, uh, physically, we have it socially or spiritually. And we're all infect if we're not affected, regardless, we're infected. If we're not infected, we're affected. And, um, and I had got a different photographer at the time, Mark Seliger, and, and he and I flew to South Africa, and we photographed Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and Zaki Ahmed, and we photographed Dr. Solomon in India and, and Elizabeth Tell and Elton John in Los Angeles. And so, um, and the bringing together of the community had not been done before, and that was, you know, a level of, of, of engagement fulfillment that I had never experienced. And, but again, still, it was then set a new standard from which I now had to go further. And, and um, you know, I, I've continued to do that. Um, and it continues to be, um, make everything more meaningful. It's, it's beautiful hearing about it for someone like me in my generation looking back, because often we think that all of these challenges are new because we're experiencing them for the first time. And so when you're hearing it back from someone who's a change maker, who's actually been working on meaningful things for such a long period of time, two questions come to mind. The first one is, I feel like from a personal level, everyone has to get to that point in life where they may be doing something that's fulfilling, like you said, but it's not deeply meaningful. I feel like everyone has to or will get to that stage in their life where they have to ask that question. What are you? What I are also you don't know at the end if those two expressions are mutually exclusive. I don't know if anything could be fulfilling if it isn't at some level meaningful. Sure. Just to you or to your people you, that are in your life, people that that uh, um, that inspire you or are inspired by what you do. So, um, so I think we're always searching for mm -hmm. that, and, and and that's a moving target. I don't think it's it doesn't change. And I think every day we come to work and we, you know, we look at it. And people, you know, people at the time, I'll go back a little bit to when I started the business, and they said to me, "Were you nervous? Because you put a lot at stake. You know, you left where you were, and you you really made it hard to ever go back. And you made a commitment to do this without really knowing what, you know, where this was going to take you." And you know, was it hard? Was were, were you nervous? And I said, you know what, I never really thought about that scenario. I never thought about it in that regard about failing. And um, and I and I then I want to say, but I knew somehow I'd make it work. But what I didn't explain to people because I didn't know how to was I never that the it was very undefined and continues to be. Yeah. So, because the factors and influence it continue to change every day. So, and I knew I'd figure out how to stay relevant and how to have a reason to exist. And, I, and, and that, the need to do that, mm. you know, is, still exists today, 35 years later. 
And, and that was my second question, that seeing as you were asking these questions 30 years ago, you were thinking about this stuff 30 years ago, do you think that we've gotten closer to a more evolved world where people are asking these questions more often? Or are we going backwards? Are we still in the same place? Or is it always the same cycle? There's a beautiful quote by Mark Twain where he says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it always rhymes. And so I wonder, where, how does that fit into this? Where does that thought process fit into this? So, you know, I, I think that we need to learn, you know, we need to know what the past so that we know how to contextualize the present and the future. So, and in fashion, I was always obsessed with the universal alternatives. And not so that I knew what to make, but often so I knew what not to make. And, and nobody needs what's there. So, but absent of knowing what, what the current existing alternatives are, you don't know how to, how to um, create uh, a creative, innovative um, alternative. So, um, so you need to know the history, you need to know the present, and, um, and, and I love Mark Twain's. Um, yeah, so, um, <laughs> me too, huge fan. Uh, right, so, um, you know, I, and I think it's, you know, we reflect on it often. I, at the time when I started doing my work with Amphar, it was, there wasn't, there wasn't this collective, um, uh, I, I forget what they called it at the time, um, it, it corporate, um, social responsibility. Uh, I mean, this wasn't, it just was something that seemed right to do and there wasn't a name for it and, and there wasn't a classification, a characterization of it per se. Maybe it was philanthropy at, at some level. But, and then, you know, interestingly, um, I learned over the years and partially from my daughter, um, my, my middle daughter Amanda, who was obsessed with not that we're doing philanthropy because philanthropy was something that, or community engagement was something that you should do and everybody did. But it became about not just what you did, but how you did it and the impact that you made. And the transparency within which you communicated that. And um, so, you know, so the process of, you know, of our community outreach has changed profoundly over the years and, and how we engage with communities and, and how we do it in a way that ensures results um, with absolute um, transparency and accountability is, um, is, is really important today, which yeah. in the past yeah. wasn't so. so. Absolutely. I don't know if that... Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. It does answer question. my question, yeah. One of the things I love about you, Kenneth, from our, from our couple of meetings that we've had is that you're extremely humble uh, and in, in, in a positive way. You're confident, but you're humble in the sense that you, you always consider yourself a learner. You always consider you're growing and you feel that, there's this beautiful quote that I picked out of yours actually, so now I get to quote you, as well as quote Mark Twain in the same podcast. So we have, I wanted, here we go, it's, uh, if you stand on what you've accomplished, it gets in the way of what you still need to do. And when I read that, it reminded me of Steve Jobs. And I was sharing with you earlier that Steve Jobs, when he came back to Apple, he saw that in the entrance they had this Apple Museum and he asked for it to be destroyed because he didn't want to live and work for a company that was still living and operating in the past. How do you practically apply that mindset every day at work? And how do you get the people that you work with to apply that mindset as well? Because actually, majority of us are quite happy to just celebrate the past and live on the glories and the success of the past and nostalgia. We always think about the good old days. It's part of our human psychology. How have you shifted that? How do you get other people to shift as well? So I didn't know that story about Steve Jobs, but, but I, one of my biggest regrets, but maybe it's a conscious process, so it shouldn't be, is that I don't have any, an archive of my past products over the 30 years. And people have always said, asked me that. Wow. And I never saved it because I always felt maybe, maybe because we need to stay focused on going forward. And at these various milestones in my career, people have encouraged me to write books and tell these stories, and, and I've resisted it. And I've still never really told the whole story. I've told it anecdotally in a book called Footnotes 15 years ago, and then in a, um, recently in a book um, called Ken A Kenneth Cole Production or something. But it was episodic and it wasn't really about, it, w it wasn't the story. Because I'm, I'm, I believe that if we allow ourselves 
to, it's like driving a car. If you're going to look in the rearview mirror, you're going you, to you're going to miss that next bump in the road. So you, if you don't stay focused on where we have to, where you need to go, you significantly encumber your likelihood of getting there. And and I do believe that what we've done over these years is we've built a great foundation from which to do what we first now need to do. And um, and you can't stay idle in, in, in the business, which is why it's a great business, the fashion business, but, um, but it's also why it's, it's so difficult. So, um, and I think it's an indulgence that I've avoided, um, you know, reflecting too much on, on, on the past. And, but it's, it is true. I do think we need to stay focused on, on the future. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I don't want to celebrate the past anymore except to the degree that now this is what defines our platform. And I say to people that um, there is a literally an infinite, as I said, amount of alternatives today to what we bring to market. Nobody needs what we sell, which is very humbling. There's not an American that needs another pair of shoes. Um, even most people, you know, without means have shoes today. And, Maybe not the shoes they want, and maybe not, but in the condition that they should have. But um, uh, and if, as I've said, if we closed our stores tomorrow at noon, it's hardly in America would go barefoot for for 14 years. So um, we uh, we need to give them, we need to make them think they want it. Glad they thought it and think it again. Um, but at the end of the days, we can't um, delude ourselves. And we need to be realistic and understand that uh, we create something that people need to want, they don't need. But if we attach it to something that, that connects with them in a meaningful way, then what we do becomes more meaningful. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't answer your question. I think I straight. That's okay. I loved it. I loved the tangent you went on. It was, it was a great tangent. And that's, that comes back to your whole principle of it's not just what people stand in, it's what they stand for. And, and that reminds me, everything you do just echoes in timelessness for me and that's what I love like it literally echoes because there's a beautiful statement by Martin Luther King around you know someone who stands for nothing will fall for anything and then there's another beautiful statement that says someone who has nothing to die for has nothing to live for and then when I hear your statement around people who have it's not just about what they stand in it's what they stand for and I truly agree with you I, I believe with you that that fashion without meaning or clothes without meaning don't make us happy. They, d they don't stand for anything beyond. And actually that's where we get, become consumers right. as opposed to conscious creators or expressives. Right. I, I knew where I was going. Oh, yeah, go on, tell me. I just, I just, you just prompted me. Reminded Good. Me. So <laughs> people have infinite choices today. Um, I believe after all these years, I've earned the right only to be considered. And every day I have to earn the right to be chosen. And, and I can't become complacent and lax in, and rest on what we've done in the past because I need to be relevant um, and, and a relevant, a competitive and relevant alternative today and, and then even more so tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like that, that old cliche of curiosity killed the cat needs to change to complacency killed the cat because curiosity should be encouraged. Curiosity should be the future, that's, that's how we explore. It's complacency that actually makes you fall back and fall behind and lose, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I agree. But it's not, I mean, you, yeah, I just think you, the, you need to every day contextualize what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, because it's moving so fast, and, and today in my world, everything is global. Everything is interconnected. You know, the notion of building a physical wall separating two countries um, is so uh, is, is, is so silly mm -hmm. to me because at the end of the day we are so connected um, everywhere today um, and virtually and and electronically and we have the ability to to to, to speak to and inspire and move um, people wherever they are all the time. Um, and, and I think today everybody is uh, in the media business. 
Yes. We're I think we were talking about that briefly before. And we don't need the media to help amplify and tell our stories because we can all find audiences. Mm -hmm. And there are social platforms today we can connect with audiences and effortlessly. And, um, and we all have the ability to amplify ours and each other's stories. And we can, and, uh, we can um, align with, and build an even bigger platform and people can get together and we can retweet and repost and, and, uh, and there's no end to how far you know, we, we can effectively um, uh, proceed in that regard. Yeah. And I, and I love that about you and anyone who's listening or watching right now, you should definitely follow Kenneth on Instagram because I, I find that you're extremely witty, it's extremely relevant, it's, it's, it's beautiful to watch because I find so many executives, CEOs, founders don't necessarily manage their own accounts. And there's like a million layers between the individual and then what actually gets posted. Whereas with you, it's, it's, it's very close, it's very authentic, it's, it's stuff you're thinking about, it's things that are, are fresh off your mind. And I found that refreshing when we met because I know that as someone who's extremely busy, involved in so many different things, for you to even find time to post on Instagram, but you do, and it's meaningful and it's witty. It's not just putting out a corporate stamp. And that's what I love. You've been able to differentiate the man and the brand, as you said. Yeah, and that's partially how I was able to do it because we've gone back and forth. And so the brand tells the business story and I tell my story and I, I don't take what I do seriously. Um, I take um, the world seriously, but I don't take what I do seriously. And- What do you mean by that? Well, I think that nobody needs what I sell. Right. So, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't present it in a way that's any, that's any bigger than that. Sure. Um, I have to make you want it and want it again. And I know that. And I do think it makes us feel great about ourselves. And I do think that um, wardrobing one is an extraordinary privilege. And I don't want this to be misinterpreted because I think when we wake up in the morning, we have a clean, as clean slate, we have a, the ability to represent ourselves to the world every day on our own terms, unedited. Because most of the people you encounter in a given day don't get to know any more about you than how you present yourself. And so you can send a very powerful message um, to the world um, independently, individually, um, every day. And to be part of that is an extraordinary privilege if I can be part of that expression, that self-expression that you choose to make. And, and I don't take that seriously, but at the end of the day, as I've, you, know, you wake up in the morning, um, it's not usually the first thing on your mind, um, especially if someone in your world isn't well mm. or if you're hungry. And um, so I need to somehow keep it in context. So, and you know, I, and as I've often said, I can't change the world alone, but I can be an accessory. <laughs> I love that. So, um, I love it. and hopefully I'm enabled and allowed to do that and empowered to do that. Yeah. In, in, your, in your spirit of always being a learner, you told me a beautiful story about how you've been learning even from your daughter. And, and I wanted to just share that with context of just how you've recognized this ability to learn from everything and everyone around you. When we met, you not only mentor, but you're willing to learn from those that you mentor. Like there's this beautiful reciprocal exchange in your life that exists. And, and the spirit and the energy you've built around yourself of always learning from everything around you. Yeah, I think I, I love the access we're all provided. Um, through social media and just and the likes to to be enlightened and inspired by so much from so many. Um, I, the story that I was telling you before was when I, the one I was trying to t write this book. I guess I think it was the first one. It was footnotes. Um, my daughter Katie was eight, was eight at the time, so I could probably figure out when this was. But um, I would come home from work and I'd have to edit or these work because it was I was on a deadline and. And she asked me if I could help her with her homework. And I'd say, Katie, I need just a few more. I need a half an hour. I have to work on this project. And then I'll be there, I promise. And then she'd ask me this question. I remember it vividly. And it was, who gives you the work? Which I found interesting because she's at school. And at school, you don't have work unless somebody gives you the work. And then she says to me, and I said, well, I give it to myself because I need to do it. And then she says, well, aren't you the boss? And it says, I am, and that's why I give it to myself, because if, if I don't, no one's going to do it. 
So I'm thinking to myself, I just, you know, it was an opportunity to share an important lesson with my daughter. And then the next day, the same time, right after dinner, Katie says to me, so can you help me with this other project? And I said, well, I can, but just like yesterday, I need a little bit of time and then I will be there, I promise. And then so she, this time she changed the question. She says, aren't you the boss? And I'm saying to myself, I just answered this question. And then she said, and I said, yes, but I have to do it. And then she says, well, who gives you the work? And, and this went on for three or four days. And then um, I was, uh, and it was the same questions each time. And, and then I saw this spiritual advisor of mine uh, shortly after that. And he says to me, how is Katie? And I said, you know, it's funny because you know, we went through this process and she asked me to help her and I was working on something I had to get done and she says, aren't you the boss and who gives you the work? And, and, then, the, and then after several days, she kept asking the same questions and I said to him, it's amazing, she just doesn't get it. And he said to me, or you don't. She spent a week trying to teach you a lesson and you clearly still didn't, didn't learn it. And, and the lesson is, that we're in, we make these choices. And I was choosing to prioritize them over her. And it wasn't, uh, and it was, I had the ability to change that and I was choosing not to. So, but we are empowered to, to, to do most of what we do is we are empowered to change it, we're empowered to affect it. And we're very comfortable sometimes attributing that to other forces. Mm, absolutely, always removing our own accountability somehow. And thank you for sharing that. I know it's, a, it's definitely an open and vulnerable share, but it's, it's so important for us to recognize that, that we are accountable, we are responsible, especially those of us who have created lives where you are working for yourself. And I find myself in that trap all the time that I love what I do, I'm blessed to do what I do, I feel very fortunate to do it. That means I do it all the time because it's, you feel so fortunate and blessed to be able to have that right. privilege. Yeah, and then you do it in a way, you know, where your, your beautiful wife works with you and it's part of what you do at home, it's part of what you do, is your career, it's, you're emotionally vested in it and that you're professionally committed to it. And which is why you're so inspiring to so many of us because um, um, you offer us so much um, in that process. You're very kind. <laughs> No, that's beautiful. I, I, I wanted to ask you, what have you done as a, is there, has there been a Kenneth Cole daily ritual, a daily aspect of your life that has been there throughout, or is there a new one? Does it change every few months or year? Has there been something that you've done, asked yourself, practiced on a, on a regular basis, even if it's not daily, weekly, that, that you feel has been a cornerstone for your success, both internally and externally? When I sit with you, I feel I'm with someone who's both internally and externally successful, however you define that word, but someone who's accomplished on both levels. So what has been, is, has there been a cornerstone practice that's always been there? You know, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I, what I've often said to people is that the best part of what I do is that over all those many years, there's been no two days I've done the same thing because you know, I'm touching so many aspects of the business and I'm touching the customer in so many different ways. Um, you know, I've often said that I, um, I need to put myself in the customer's shoes in the hope that they'll put themselves in mine. <laughs> but, um, but I'm not, and I'm, I'm, I don't have a ritual. Um, I don't, and, uh, and probably I should, and most successful people I know do. And, um, but I do have a sense of, I do, I do have visualize where I want to be and what is the best way to get there. And, I, and a, a, an example that I have often been using these days is if we all agree that we want to be in California by Sunday, then let's also know we have to be in St. Louis by Wednesday. <laughs> yes. And Denver by Thursday. Yes. Um, not Chicago, not, not Florida, and not Texas. So, and I always kind of check myself. Am I on a path that kind of takes me somewhat in the direction I want to go? Mm. I love that. And I think you do. I, th I think you have them, whether they're conscious or subconscious, your ability to question, your comfort with change, like to even say that you don't do the same thing every day. 
most people think that they aspire for that, but most people don't really want that because that's not easy to be able to deal with new situations, new scenarios on a daily basis. I, at work, I, I say to my associates often, are we going to do what we're going to do on Monday just because it's what we did last Monday? Yeah. Because next Monday is a different world than it was last Monday. So, there you go. And, and just make sure you're asked, we're taking, you know, we're taking our pulse and we're taking that into consideration. And if it is the same, then so be it. But Yeah. I love it. Is there anything we haven't covered? Anything in your mind that you wanted to share? Maybe, I, I don't know if you wanted to talk about UN and Sundance. So, depending on your involvement more specifically. So um, I accepted a UN appointment uh, about a year ago um, because they had just put forth a declaration to end AIDS by 2030. And, but I did it conditionally, and that is that they agree that to, to, a, to accept cure as a component because if we don't have a cure by 2020, we're close to that, you're not going to end AIDS by 2030. And that was the kind of the AMFAR agenda. So I was trying to marry my agendas so I could then accept um, you know, that generous uh, gesture that was put forth. Um, and so, um, so then, and then how do we bring other resources?